Hello and welcome to the first part of a two-part discussion on melody. This first part is going to involve some basic terms, a bit about notation and in the Western world of melody, and the second part is going to involve uh, other aspects, other approaches to melody. So when we talk about the Western approach to melodic content, um, and we'll, don't worry, we'll get into definitions, you know, like what is melody, that sort of thing. We'll get into that in a second. But most of what we could call like Western classical concert art music uh, could be traced back to what's called Gregorian chant. Uh, so very, very quickly, uh, this was uh, Pope Gregory uh, wanted to uh, come up with a, a way to write down uh, musical notation for uh, the singing of sacred texts. And we could back, back back up a little further and ask, well, why were they singing sacred texts in the first place? Um, well, and you might be able to think about why this is. Uh, imagine you're, you are in a setting several hundred years ago where you needed your voice to be heard to a room full of people and there's no amplification, right? Now you're dealing with you know ambient noise, wind, and, and just general shuffling and the sound of life in the room. So one of the best ways of making your voice carry was to actually sing. Because if you're holding a pitch out, I'm not a singer, please don't judge. But if you're holding a pitch out, it will actually your voice will carry and you'll be able to reach the back of the room. And that's one of the ideas in just in music in general is we always talk about like making sure that whatever we're doing just like in, in dance, you want to communicate to every seat in the house. Musically, you want to be heard at any seat in the house. And so, as you might imagine, that, that works with speaking as well. So, you can actually extrapolate pretty easily. Well, as people were singing this in order to be heard, then they started to come upon different combinations of notes uh, that would enhance the the sacred text that they were uh, speaking at the moment. So uh, as as that developed, uh, you then started to get a, also a system of notation, and this Gregorian chant, which is the general term for this genre, it's single line sung music. It's what's called monophonic, meaning single sound, right? There's not uh, melody and accompaniment, there's not counterpoint, there's no opposition or differentiation besides men and women singing about uh, an octave apart. We'll talk about what an octave is in a little bit. So as a result, you get hundreds and hundreds of these little uh, melodies that were based off of text. And you had different composers trying their hand at how they could melodically set text uh, to better enhance the, the uh, religious experience of it. And uh, this is all part of the, what we'd say the, the Catholic mass, right? Uh, Sanctus, Kyrie, Agnus Dei, they're all part of uh, commonly uh, found parts of the Catholic mass. And so these, you'll find many, many different melodies all with the same text, right? Kyrie, the first text of that is Kyrie, right? And, and it falls within a certain part within the Catholic mass. And what you end up having is composers deciding, well, everybody knows that one tune. What if I did my own spin on it? What if I added a second part to it? And so you can kind of extrapolate on throughout there is, well, that was written down. How do I write down the second part that goes against it? And then how do I record it? I mean, this is already recorded in text. How do I record this other thing? And so music notation kind of stemmed out of that, uh, that, um, that want to create some variety and uh, the comp composer's individual approach to each melody. So three examples of uh, a common 
a really uh, actually fairly common uh, chant melody, which most of you have probably heard. I'm going to play uh, just for a second. I'm standing by my, my marimba, which you'll see a little bit more of in a bit. But uh, the, the, there's a chant melody called the Dies Irae, Day of Wrath, Day of Reckoning. Um, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Right? It's that basic sound. And so that might sound familiar. There are, uh, here's three examples, and I'm going to put them uh, in the link in the description, just to, for you to listen to a few, uh, few seconds of each of these examples. One of them uh, you may or may not have heard of. It's part of a uh, composition by a French composer named Hector Berlioz, named uh, Symphonie Fantastique. Um, it's a very dramatic use of brass, right? This is we're you know, fast forwarding into the 19th century uh, when this particular chant uh, melody showed up. All you know, it was hundreds of years later after it was created. Um, 20th century, we get uh, Carmina Burana, O Fortuna, right? It's a little bit more buried in there, but when you listen to that, and again, this is another one I'll, I'll check out the description so that you can see and just listen for a moment. So you can see if you can hear the uh, the shadow of that Dies Irae melody. And the last one is the opening sequence. If you've ever seen the movie The Shining, um, that uh, very uh, iconic drive through the mountains, and there's a synthesizer melody uh, that's happening, uh, very ominous sounding. And that's the that's directly the Dies Irae. It's just in a, in, instead of being sung. It's using uh, a synthesizer in that case. So Gregorian chant, just to summarize this a little bit of the introduction, Gregorian chant starts the seeds of notation and what came to be the musical vocabulary for Western music. We'll talk about non-Western music later, but this is, we're just starting in the classical world uh, a lot of what you hear in ballet class can be directly traced back in some shape or form to melodies of these or composers that then spun them out into other variations. Now, variations, that's another thing to talk about. So we're going to listen to a piano sonata, just one movement of a sonata. The sonata is a, a suite, a collection of different movements. And we're going to listen to a uh, one of them, which is a theme and variations um, composition. And it has a, a theme, which is a, just a, a general tune, a general melodic uh, statement. And then it has six different variations. And as you listen to it, and we're going to listen to it together, and of course, I want you to also listen to it on your own. But as you listen to it, I want you to think about what makes each variation distinct. And I'll put timestamps so that you can be sure you are aware of what uh, variation is starting when. And I'll also make available the score so that you can follow along the contour in the general rhythmic activity and uh, level of energy in the music. So. I, uh, I'll put in some uh, descriptions of each of the uh, variations. And one of the things I want you to be able to do is be able to identify which variation you're listening to, right? So it's not, uh, we're going to get past the, oh, um, that's Mozart piano to that's this variation of the variation, uh, theme and variation movement, right? So I, in other words, I want you to engage a little bit more with the material so that you can better orient yourself in a piece of music where you don't have text or various instrumentation coming in and out to hang your, uh, you know, to, to find reference points in, okay? So that will be, and that's actually um, the, the A major piano sonata number 11, um, 
and this is the one where the last movement is the 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 Turkish march uh, right that one right that was on the spur of the moment I decided to play that for you but that's the last movement of uh, this sonata but we're going to listen to the first movement of it so some terms right let's get into the terms so what is melody? Well, uh, with the movie uh, metaphor that we talked about in the beginning of the class, this is the narrative. This is the story, uh, the singable part, the, um, the recognizably singable part. Uh, if you have words in a song, if you remove the words, the melody is what's left, right? So if you think about that, that means that if you start listening to music and imagining what would be left over without the words, you can start to assess it in very different ways. Uh, this is what gives music kind of an arc, a storyline of beginning, middle, and end. So as you listen to those themes and variations, see if you can hear how the melody uh, introduces itself and many times will sound like it reaches a halfway point or like a question and then continues on to answer that question. Or you could think of it as stability, instability, stability again, right? And that's a very common thing. Like we, we can't, there's no motivation for action without instability. If everybody's comfortable, why bother changing anything, right? And as we talk, especially as we talk about jazz, that's gonna be uh, jazz and jazz harmony, especially that's gonna become something uh, that becomes very relevant is the uh, consonance or stability versus dissonance or instability. Just a little aside there. So the basic raw material of melody is pitch or specific frequencies. Frequencies is actually measured uh, scientifically. We can measure it in cycles per second. Um, and that's, by the way, when you tune an instrument, where, uh, for example, this note right here, As a matter of fact, I will switch the camera just so you get a little glimpse of what I'm playing right here. This note right here is an A, and this A vibrates at 440 cycles per second, or as long as it's in tune, it should vibrate at that speed. And when you hear a group, uh, where they don't all agree on what this note uh, vibrates at. Maybe some somebody's at 444 and someone's at 438. Um, that's what gives music, especially if any of you have ever played in uh, like you know school band, especially like as as you start to you know start off in the beginning stages of things. If you ever play in the school band and you hear that sourness or you've gone to a school band concert and it sounds like, you know, something's a little bit unsettling, it's because there's a disagreement, whether they know it or not, uh, whether they're aware of it or not, as to where, for example, this note is exactly the cycles per second. And so the better the group is, the more that they can agree, whether it's 440 or 442, or in, in Japan, I believe it's 444 uh, is the reference point that they use. Um, you get, you, the more agreement there is, the purer the sound goes. Now, this is Western music. When we get into, for example, Indonesian music, different story, right? Uh, and, and the disagreement actually has a religious significance. We'll get to that. So again, just to wrap up what the definition of melody is, it's, it's uh, another word for a melody is the tune, right? Uh, you know, whistling a tune, singing a tune. Um, it basically is a way to organize, formally or informally, uh, pitches into sequences which have a distinct contour and rhythm, right? So contour, the shape, how it carves out through sonic space, and uh, the rhythm, the timing, the pacing of it. Now, and I want you to think back to the Mozart theme and variations, uh, or you know, remember this comment as you listen to the Mozart theme and variations, um, and see if you can figure out 
what makes the variations still connected to that original theme. And very much it has to do with that arc, uh, the contour. We're talking in abstract terms and we're not talking about like one-to-one -one relationships. This is not something that can be perfectly mathematically plotted. So you're, what you want to try and do is find a way to make the connection for yourself. Sometimes it'll be very easy. Sometimes you'll have to listen past the surface of the music. You'll have to listen beneath the surface to hear and it will take more than one listening, right? So you will be rewarded for your attention coming and coming back to something and listening to it uh, because you'll be able to pick up more relationships, right? Uh, between an original melody and a varied melody. But what makes it be able to be varied in the first place, but still be recognizable as uh, something related to that first thing, is that there are certain aspects uh, that are distinctive uh, in a given song, right? Some songs more than others, some pieces more than others, to use the proper term. And move on here. So every culture has its own way. And again, we're like, this is a little bit more of a 10,000 foot view here. But every culture has its own way of organizing um, uh, melodies so that not everybody in the world, so that like we talk about pitch being the basic uh, material that melodies are made out of, not everybody in the world would agree that that the next note needs to be this, right? As a matter of fact, just today, I was playing some music with a friend of mine and I played, we were doing something uh, and where I, I ended something deliberately there, which, which that has a nice kind of quality to it. And she just couldn't stand it. So she came over and played that. So that is, you know, that, depending on the culture you're coming from, you do or don't hear tendencies for certain notes come about. Now, one of the most common aspects of music that we hear in popular music is repetition. We Like whatever the melody is or the thematic material is, it tends to be a bit shorter and a little bit more uh, frequently repeated. Um, now, Western music calls this an ostinato. That's the term I'll, I'll throw in the description there so you can check it out. A short, repetitive, and distinctive musical pattern. Uh, sometimes these are also called riffs, especially when they're associated with guitar playing. A riff or an ostinato. Riff can also be used a little bit more freely uh, and it, it implies a little bit of spontaneous um, generation. You know, I'm riffing off of a theme as opposed to I'm playing an ostinato. An ostinato has a little bit more of a formal kind of suit and tie uh, connotation to it. Um, I'm going to put, and I want everybody to check this out, I'm going to put a very small score sample in the music, uh, or in the, sorry, in the, the video description. And I want you to check it out and see if now maybe you your your music reading was really good before you even took the first year music curriculum uh, but even if you can just remember how to read the rhythms and you look at the tempo in there it's 112 beats per minute i want to see if you can guess what song this ostinato is just so you can kind of put a face to the name or, or put a face to the voice rather um so this is and again one of the, my hopes for this class is that you can start to feel comfortable using slightly more specific, intelligent, and universal terminology in your communication with musicians, composers, dancers, producers, uh, stage managers, anybody involved uh, so that you don't have to on the spot invent terminology when there's a perfectly good existing word already. So I'm going to, I want you to check out that ostinato, the mystery ostinato, and I'm going to put in, and I want to see if you can figure out what it is. I'm not going to tell it to you, but it might make an appearance uh, on an exam. 
All right. So now let's get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of the notation and uh, and how that relates to the piano keyboard layout. So why do we use the piano keyboard? Well, the piano keyboard, and there's uh, going to be a couple graphics that I want you to refer to, um, uh, keyboard graphics. I'll, I'll name them keyboard graphics. Um, that also show how uh, music is notated in correlation and correspondence with the notes on the keyboard. Why do we use piano? Why do uh, a lot of the best musicians in any genre, or almost any genre, um, have a piano playing background, even if that's not their primary instrument, why that is? And I wonder, you know, before I answer that question, pause the video, give it some thought. Why might that be? Why is the piano uh, an instrument, a good uh, kind of jumping off point and de demonstration? And while you think about that, I'm going to switch cameras and move over to my other location. So you're thinking about that question, right? And the answer is going to have to do with, very simply, the number of notes available to you, right? We have a lot of notes available on the, on the piano. We have 88 keys. Um, this marimba has, uh, let me, I'm going to do some quick math. You, uh, you can see this note on your left, this note on your right, right? And these two notes, uh, which, you know, I'm, my arms are fairly spread apart. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can give you, I'll put my hand here for scale, right? So you can see exactly how big it is, right? So these, this is two octaves, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight octaves eight notes apart, right? Um, and a piano has six octaves, plus a, plus a little bit in change. And this is probably, I would say, about three feet apart from each other. So the piano, because the notes are smaller, you can fit a lot more uh, range, a lot more lower notes and a lot more higher notes. And therefore, it can encompass almost all of the music that human beings are going to be able to distinguish. Of course, we can get higher notes, but uh, the piano does a great job of anchoring down the range of functional and usable, there's my hands, the functional and usable uh, musical range that human beings can, uh, can enjoy. I'm gonna fix something real quick here. So now, we go to this uh, keyboard graphic number one, and you'll see two octaves with middle C in the middle. That's that note right there. I put my uh, mallet right there. And then you have a uh, the low C, which is the note all the way on the left. This is keyboard graphic number one. And this is the C above middle C. So you can kind of, let's see, make this more pleasing visually for you. So on this instrument, I'm just showing you what it looks like. And although we don't have white and black notes on this keyboard, we do have two what's called manuals. These would be the white notes right here, right? And then these are the black notes of the piano, right? So we're gonna just, just in case you don't know how to refer to these notes, uh, or, or what they sound like next to each other if you've never poked around on a piano. By the way, uh, the next time you have the opportunity to do so, um, go play around on a piano and just and play around uh, with this a little bit just to, to test this thing out. Middle C is the C right in the middle of the piano, just beneath the group of two black notes we got. Right, that's that's our C. And when you look at the way the music is written on the staff, remember that the you know the five lines of the staff. Just we're just doing a, a like a once over of notation. We're not going to study notation with the intent of being able to perform a lot on it. But if you look at the lines on the staff, uh, you know each uh, the treble clef and the bass clef, the high notes and the and the low notes. High notes would be on this side. Low notes would be on this side. So bass clef, treble clef, 
up here. And uh, if you notice the note heads, ignore the vertical stems that you see there. If you notice the note heads um, themselves, they alternate from being in a space to being on a line. And I want you to, to, to remember that um, as we go forward and we talk about what scales are. Right? Remember the space line, space line sort of thing. Um, and this graphic you'll see is uh, put together so that if you line up the first C all the way on your left, and you look at the note on the piano keyboard above it, you'll see where that exact note is, just so you can orient yourself. And so technically speaking, with a little bit of experimentation, because you guys can read rhythms, and I've shown you this little cheat sheet in case you didn't know about it, um, about where the notes are, you guys can actually play, uh, given enough time, you could teach yourself piano. Your technique might not be great, but you know where the notes are and you know how to read rhythms. And notes and rhythms create melody. So you could play a pretty simple version, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretty quickly of, you know, let's say, for example, happy birthday, right? Um, more on that later, by the way. Go to keyboard graphic number two. And so this is where we're talking about the black notes. Just to, so we have, on uh, the white notes, we have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C, right? Everybody can do this way in the alphabet, but going backwards, musicians are pretty good at that because we have to do all sorts of orders um, uh, for this. So now when we start to mix in these accidentals, we have a moment here. We're going to use all told. Go to, and as a matter of fact, uh, so you're looking at the 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 second uh, second keyboard graphic. Um, in the Western system of naming notes, how many letters did I use before I repeated one? Right. Think about this. How many letters? You know, and I'll switch my camera back just to bring things back to a little variety here. But how many letters did I use, right? C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C. Seven letters, right? Right. The eighth, remember that octave, is where we repeat the first one. So the eighth note, not to be confused with eighth notes, right? The rhythm eighth notes, but the eighth note, C, D, E, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, we would, we would uh, loop around. Why it starts on C, not my place. I'm actually not even sure uh, why it doesn't start on A. That could be a, the, I'm sure there are term papers and theses written about that sort of thing. Um, so those are all the white notes. And then will we alter those white notes by a half step? We'll talk about what a half step is in a second. Uh, those are called, the black notes are called accidentals. That's the general term. Flats and sharps is another term that we can apply to those. And they fall in between some of the white notes, but not all of the white notes, in part for graphic reasons, right? You, if like, if all it was was white note, black note, white note, black note, white note, black note, there would be no reference point. So uh, you wouldn't know where C was versus D because there's nothing to distinguish them just geographically, geometrically. Right? There's nothing to look at to find your place. So the groups of two and three are in part a way to uh, just keep your place within an octave. Right? And so we have flats and sharps, uh, uh, and those are the black notes. Now. Each of these black notes has two different spellings. Because um, you could say, well, what, you know, why is this note sharp, but the other black note is flat? Well, it's because actually all of the notes, all of the black notes can be spelled two different ways. So if you think of homophones, right? Two words that sound alike, but are spelled differently, like your and your, or there and there, right? The internet is great at pointing out which one is, should have been used. Um, 
right? Where, what determines which one is used? Context, right? Ultimately, the sound, if you're just talking, it doesn't matter which spelling someone was thinking in their mind because the idea is communicated clearly by the context, right? Um, so for example, if we go over to the note F sharp and we talk about F sharp is just here, right? This note, right? Well, is it F sharp or G flat? Well, F is right here. And if we make it sharp, if we raise it to the next available note, right? F going up and to the right, we're going that way to the right. That's F sharp. If we have G and we lower it to the next available note, we're making it flat, the next available note to the left. Well, what determines which note we're in or, or which uh, what the spelling is? It's just, well, if we're in the key of G major, for example, you don't have to know this, don't worry, but uh, then it would be an F. And if we're in the key of D flat major, then it would be a G flat. So it's basically like when we're climbing that ladder, right? When we're looking at the, that scale that's uh, laid out, it's going to be a way to uh, just make sure that we don't take two steps on the same rung of the ladder, right? Just, just semantics. But I, one of the reasons I, I wanted to talk about this is because part of my job is to answer the questions that like may have started to occur to you. Like, oh, you know, I don't have a musical background, but like, I know sharps, I know flats. When do you use what? Why are they called what they're called? Now you have a little bit better of an idea. Let me know if you need more clarification. I'll happily provide some. Um, let's go on. So now when we're talking about this climbing, climbing the ladder, the musical ladder, or the scale, find that again in a bit. Um, we have two different intervals. An interval is just a distance between two different places. So if you're thinking about climbing something, right, we can either have, let's use the term of steps, right? And if we have a ladder with different rungs on it, we could call each of those distances steps, right? So what if there was a secondary spot in between the main rungs that we could call a half step, right? So you're taking either a whole step or a half step. Those are the two main distances when we talk about melodic instruments. Now, before I go into talking more about whole and half steps, there are entire other instruments that can play all the notes in between, because if you imagine, well, why, you know, what about the note, right? We have B, we have C. What about the note in between? Shouldn't you be able to play the note in between? Well, absolutely. Violins can play that note in between by just changing their, um, their finger position. Singers have no obligation. Uh, there was a, a, a version of the national anthem that was going around uh, recently. That seems to be a perennial thing, people doing poorly uh, tuned versions of the national anthem uh, where the singer was just all over the place in terms of which information, uh, you know, where they chose to orient, you know, uh, where they thought C was. Um, so we're gonna talk about that, you know, that sort of music in a bit, but we talk about our, our fundamental intervals. We have the step and the half step right? Full, whole step, half step, right? So now if I play a scale of all half steps, we get what's called a chromatic scale. Chromatic, and I, what I'll do is I will spell the names of the notes as I go. C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, Notice that we didn't call it E sharp, right? E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C, right? We just played a one octave 
chromatic scale. So any, whenever, whenever you hear, when you, you hear music like that, like Flight of the Bumblebee, for example, that's music that you could refer to as being very chromatic because it's using all the colors, right? Monochromatic, single color, right? We're talking about film or photography. Uh, and then uh, we have, in this case, we have, well, the, the musical term will just be chromatic music as opposed to the the alternative is diatonic, right? Two interval, di, dyad, like you know, two of something, uh, two interval bass. So if we have, uh, you noticed I used different spellings. On the way up, I used sharps spelling, right? D sharp, I'm sorry, C sharp. D sharp, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, right? Think of sharps as like if you sit on, uh, accidentally sit on some, like a, a tack or something sharp, you want to shoot back up, right? So uh, sharps raise the note by that half step, right? We're talking about those distances. And if we do our chromatic scale down, now, again, this doesn't matter if you're just hearing it, but if you wanted to write it or refer to the notes by name on our way down, C, B, B flat, A, A flat, G, G flat, F, E, E flat, D, D flat, C, right? So we just did a one octave chromatic scale down, and that's where the flats come in handy. The flatting a note makes it lower by one of those half steps. And so think of a car with a flat tire. If it's got a flat tire, it's going to sit lower, right? A flat lowers a note, right? We have B, B flat. And if you can hear, that musical interval is a half step. One of the famous inter uh, uses of a half step is... the Jaws theme. Um, and so if you, you hear that interval, that's a trick musicians use. Often uh, for melodic content, they'll, they'll use very easy to remember melodic associations to help them remember what certain intervals sound like. So that's half steps, whole steps. So Jaws doesn't sound quite as threatening if instead of, if I use, instead of a half step, if I use a whole step interval, that's a happy shark. That's a cartoon shark right there. That's not a menacing real life great white shark, right? Versus. Wow. So we can actually change the character of the, uh, the melody by shifting around what intervals we use. On. So we finally get to define what is this scale, right? So I've, I've used that term before. The term scale and the term key are, are interesting and useful terms to understand because it gives it again it just gives you a way to refer to things scale key chord arpeggio chord and arpeggio when we talk about harmony we'll talk about those terms but right now scale and key are what we're talking about so a scale is going to be a here's a definition for you and this is something to write down a scale is a sequence of adjacent notes, right? Notes that are next to each other in ascending or descending order. And so this is where we, you, I've been using that ladder uh, analogy. Think of these like a ladder. So right, like we're going up and down, we use them to climb and descend, right? Scales and in stepwise fashion, right? Uh, ladders have rungs that are easy to easy to climb, scale and climb, like the verb to scale something, to climb it, right? That's where this, uh, this, this term comes from. Um, it, the, the reason that they are easy to climb is because the steps are close together, right? If they were far apart, well, then it wouldn't be very useful in climbing and descending. It wouldn't be safe. It wouldn't be practical, right? It's not designed. And likewise, scales are designed around what's comfortable for the human voice. 
it's easier to sing notes that are close together. If anybody's ever sung in choir, you know that, especially like the alto part uh, and the, uh, the inner part, the alto part, the tenor part, the notes are pretty close together. And then the soprano part, the high part, you know, the slightly more featured part might be a little bit more adventurous. But in general, the easier the music is, the closer the notes are to each other within the scale, right? You can have, in some cases, music that is entirely based on singing notes that are just right next to each other. Pretty easy to do on the voice, easy to conceptualize, easy to execute. So there are different types of scale, and the most common one that uh, Western music teaches is what's called the major scale. So major, uh, think, I guess you could think of it as primary, and, you know, as a synonym for major, but you could also think of it as large. And that has to do with some of the intervals within the scale. And we're not gonna go into that because then we start to get into music theory. And that's where one, I start to lose people. And two, it's like, a, how does this help me? Because it doesn't as quickly connect you with training your ear, given the amount of time that you and I have together to, to work, about, work on these things and talk about. So for us, think of the major scale as being the predominant scale. And indeed, that scale that I played before, C to C, all white notes, that was called a major scale. Play it one more time for you. Right, and musicians practice this. Musicians practice this sort of thing to develop instincts and uh, physical relationship with their instrument. So that, that the, by the way, that little thing that I did at the end was not uh, a scale that was just a little flourish. I don't want to confuse you. The notes that were right next to each other are, are the things that are part of the scale. Now, major scale, there are also minor scales, pentatonic scales. Right, so uh, the major scale, if you remember, has seven different tones, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then C, D, E, uh, uh, geez, you get the point. Um, so pentatonic would be, instead of seven tones, there would be five tones. A lot of popular music and folk music alike use pentatonic scales instead of major scales, right? Now, you can find a pentatonic scale within a major scale by just omitting two of the notes. And that's very commonly what's done. Matter of fact, I'll put a little uh, video, uh, I'll attach a little video so that you can uh, hear someone. Um, I guess this is the second time in the course where you're going to uh, bring up Harry Connick Jr. Um, but uh, you'll hear him talking about the use of pentatonics when he's, uh, I think, I believe it was like an American Idol uh, contestant. I'll put it in there. Um, and you can um, hear him react to that and kind of call it out um, in a certain way that basically just ties in that, you know, someone was indeed doing uh, a type of scale that wasn't terribly original, not to say it wasn't good, but it just wasn't original. It was something that's very heavily used in popular music. So pentatonic scale, minor scale, blues scale, whole tone scale, diminished scale chromatic scale, those are all different types. And the more complex the music is, the more different scales it can draw in when it comes to melody, right? Because these scales are all about notes that are next to each other over the course of time, not stacked on top of each other, but next to each other in time. So our major scale, now if you remember, we have a whole step, and a half step. And our major scale has a distinctive pattern. Just want to break it down, down for you real quick. And the idea behind this is that if you apply this pattern, the corresponding pull of notes can result, the collective pull of notes, for example, the white notes, is what we call a key. So key is think of kind of like a club, 
you know, uh, uh, where you have to have membership. So white notes are all in the key or in the club of C major. And the intervals, you've heard the scale many times at this point. So the intervals, well, we have C to D. See if you can, before I say them, see if you can name which of the two intervals that it's going to be, whole step or half step. Those are the only two that I'm going to give you right here. And just a reminder, if I play, let's start on C. Let me do this one here so it's easier for you to see. If I do C and then I do a half step up, that's what it sounds like. Don't worry about what it's called or what it looks like. Let's listen to it. And if I do a half step down, that's what it sounds like. So. A little bit of an eerie feel to it. If I do the same thing but use whole steps, just to, and this is just to orient you so you get a, a little bit more of an appreciation, regardless of which direction that interval is going to happen, right? Because sometimes the, the way to orient yourself in hearing a piece of music is going to be based on hearing a direction change, hearing an interval change. Um, I could tell you guys a story about using that exact type of reference point uh, when I was working with um, the Von Howard project uh, and we were using a Steve Reich piece for, to score one of his pieces of choreography uh, and it had to do with interval changes at a certain point in the piece. But I digress. So we just heard half steps, whole steps doing the same pattern. And we could actually keep going out. Right? We could keep going in chromatic fashion. But our major scale is only going to be constructed by those two intervals. So let's start. I'm going to start all the way at, the, at your left. And I want you to see if you can name the interval. First interval. Second interval. Third interval. Fourth interval. Fifth interval. Sixth interval. Seventh interval. Now, if you want to try that again, rewind it a few seconds and go back over and see if you can, in the space between when I played each pair of notes, name which of those. Say whole step, half step. Right? So now I'm going to say them. I'm going to play them again and say them. I'll give you the answers. So we have these two whole step, whole step. Half step, that's the Jaws interval. Whole step. Whole step. Whole step. And? Half step at the end. So you put them all together without the repeated notes, and we get this interval pattern, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, half. Sorry, I shouldn't talk over it. I'm going to play it one more time without, right? So you can hear those intervals. And if we go down, it's half, whole, 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 half, whole, whole. Now, this is a pattern. Again, you've heard this now you get a better understanding of it i can plug that pattern in based on any starting note so what if i want to start here well same exact interval pattern that's what makes it have the same character is the interval pattern and the quality of the the melody in this case to tie it back into to melody that we were talking about uh has everything to do with these little minute changes in distance right i can play starting on any note i don't want to lean into the frame but
right? So that was all 12 major keys. 12 because we have seven possible white notes, five possible black notes. And so I started a major scale. I started that pattern on all of those. And again, that's part of the beginning of the training of musicians is to learn how to, to command your instrument to play each of those patterns. Starting no matter what. And again, remember, each of those pools of notes defined a key. So if you play a note that is not in the key, and you, especially if you didn't intend to do that, that's what could be called off key or out of key, right? As opposed to out of tune, which has to do with, if you remember from a while back, we talked about the calibration issue. We talked about uh, making, um, making sure that uh, uh, everybody agreed on the cycles per second, that sort of thing. Um, you can actually, you can create your own scale as, as long as you're having the same number of whole steps in total, right? So if we take those two half steps in our scale pattern, cram them together to make a whole step instead. That's six whole steps in total. So an octave is equal to either 12, remember that number 12, that was an important one from before, 12 half steps or six whole steps. And you can actually make your own scale based on just creating intervals that just add up to that same number. And very commonly uh, musicians who want to come up with an, an original uh, approach to melody will do that. They'll come up with their own uh, combinations of intervals, so much so that uh, in some cases it, it starts to border on what we call atonal music. So music without a tonal center. So each of those keys, if we were playing in C major, C would be the center. It would be home base. And each of the notes around it would be varying uh, points of stability or islands of stability away from home base. Right, but then we can also compose music where the not, instead of the notes being the reference point, the intervals are the the reference point, which means that no specific note is the uh, important note anymore. Right, so the, and that's uh, part of what helps to define atonality. So we're going to wrap it up there, and uh, stay tuned to part two of melody.